them. They stare at me. They whisper when I pass. It hurts my feelings. They're confused, Alia. You frighten them. Because I'm a freak. You're not a freak. Who has said that? No one. Then don't you ever say it again. My children are not freaks. But I can't help it. I just know things. Things I shouldn't know. But I just do. No one should ever be wakened to consciousness as you were. But we'll make them understand, Alia. We'll make them see. It's Vegan Freak Radio number 54. Welcome to Vegan Freak Radio, number 54. I'm Jenna. I'm Bob. It is Monday, the 27th of November, 2006. Hope everyone survived in the U.S. Uh, the Dead Turkey Day. I hope so, too. Dead Bird Day. That's what yes. I call it in class once. I'm like, <laughs> like eh. But it really is Dead Bird Day. It is, unfortunately. I agree, unfortunately. I was thinking the other day about, man, how many millions of turkeys must be killed just for that day. Yeah. It's really screwed up. It's really sad. Did I say screwed up instead of fucked up? You did. What the hell's wrong with you? I don't know. <laughs> I've been talking too much today. Uh, two and a half hours of lecture, and now I come here and do a radio show. All right. I hope I don't lose my voice. Yeah. <laughs> just, I, just hope that. What? Just hope that you don't lose your voice. I hope not, because uh, I have a big class, 60 students. One of my classes, I lecture without a mic, and uh, I leave there. I'm usually kind of hoarse. Mm. So I'm feeling a little... I don't know. I, my, my voice feels kind of odd today. <laughs> You need a soothing tea. I had a soothing tea. Okay. Ah, uh. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> yes. Anyway, uh, another week of Vegan Figure Radio. We got a couple things going on today. The big thing on the show today, the more, the most interesting thing on the show today, probably, is that we have Dr. Michael Greger on the show. He'll be at the end of the show talking about his new book, Bird Flu. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna do some little bits and pieces of things here and there. Yeah, uh, we are kind of like totally crazy this week so we didn't have a lot like totally <laughs> we, like didn't have time to like put together a real like show so like oh, dude we're gonna like do some things um <laughs> we got a couple of things going on go ahead okay first we have some announcements okay and uh we're also going to talk about is what we're gonna is the announcement the ass hats and angels thing is that an announcement or is that something separate sure that's an announcement okay we're also um <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I don't know oh, what else we're going to okay. talk about. Right. Oh, we're going to help be- vegetarians go vegan. Yes, we yes, are. we are. <laughs> and we got some annoying things from you know in the media as usual, and that's about it. Yeah, okay, yeah. short show this short. week. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, it's going to have to be because uh, again, I'm afraid about my voice going south. <laughs> so. So. Yeah. Um, I guess the first thing we want to talk about is that uh, we listen to Sirius Radio. OutQ has a very nice show on, a uh, very good show on from Michelangelo Signorelli. And uh, if you don't know who he is, he's fucking awesome. I like to listen to his show pretty often. Um, and he does a thing every year. Who, what do they have? Well, on Thanksgiving, he does this annoying thing called the turkeys of the year. Species which, is. Yes. Yeah. Which is a really annoying because these are people who are have basically fallen and they're assholes. And you know, right. people like Mark Foley and... Uh, uh, George Allen, you know, these kind of people got Turkey of the Year awards. Right. But at the end of the year, he does these things, like the scumbags and <laughs> gas, <laughs> gas bags. bags. Gas bags. And, he and, does the gassies. Yeah, the gassy awards uh, yeah. for people who are, you the know, <laughs> are kind of still in power, but really annoying. And, yeah. But then he also does the Angels of the Year for yep. people who really deserve some credit and for who, who've done good things. So we thought that on Vegan Freak Radio, we would make it fun as the holiday season approaches and actually have... An ass hats and angels contest. Yes, <laughs> not a contest, but you, you, our lovely listeners out there, can submit to us the names of people that you think are ass hats. And by ass hats, we mean ass hats in terms of veganism. People who have done something that has bothered you, offended you, annoyed you, that has not been good for the cause. That whatever, right? Right. And this can be, you know, anyone, anyone, anyone. in the media, and it doesn't have to be in the movement or anything like no. that. Just be, you know. 
anyone who deserves that award. It could be someone in the movement, though. Sure. If could. you want it. Right. Uh, Ass Hats and Angels. So we'll, we'll be accepting it, nominations for the Ass Hats. And then Angels. I mean, it's obvious enough. Yeah, people who've done really great things for veganism. That's right. And we're going to throw in a few of our own of of ideas. <laughs> and we want your suggestions as well, because we certainly don't know everything that's out there. So give us, uh, send us an email or give us a voicemail. Yep. And uh, I think what we'll probably do is accumulate all these for one big show sometime in the next month or so. What the hell's going on with my volume? Wonky knobs. My, wo- <laughs> <laughs> my knobs are a bit wonky. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Would you like to play with my knobs? <laughs> you want to twiddle my knobs? You have more than one? Hmm. <laughs> could be, could be. Uh, if I do, that would be very special. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen pictures of people who have a third nipple and they pierce it? <laughs> no, I haven't seen these pictures. I have. Okay. <laughs> I, I guarantee you that Ida has as well, misanthropy. I'm sure. Speaking of misanthropy and third nipples. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great segue there, Bob. <laughs> I don't know if she has three nipples. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but someone does. Yeah. And I say, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, she, um, I only say it because she's heavy into the bod mod, body mod, modification community. Mm-hmm. That's why I thought mm-hmm. third nipple. <laughs> I, that's where I saw If anyone them. has seen a picture of it, she has. If, if anyone has seen a picture of anything that is really <laughs> fucking weird in terms of body modification, Ida. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of Ida, we need to offer a very special vegan freak radio congratulations to Ida and Richard. Mm-hmm. Or misanthropy and living in photographs <laughs> on our forums because everyone get close to the radio. They got married. <laughs> yay! <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, we only have the yay. I only have the booing. Boo. Okay, now shut <laughs> No! <laughs> but, yay! Just think that okay. this yay. Um, they got married. So, uh, not long ago, mm-hmm. they posted a picture of it on the forums and it was like, are we married? Question mark. And no one was really <laughs> sure if it was true or not. We're here to tell you that, in fact, it is true. Uh, one of several Vegan Freak forum hookups. I know. <laughs> this, is, this has been great. This is the second one. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's been awesome. So congratulations to two people who definitely deserve congratulations. Absolutely. And uh, I, they're just both awesome. And yeah. I want to wish them the absolute very best with one another. So very happy. if you don't know who they are, um, you know, you just have to put up with this. But <laughs> if you do know who they are, and a lot of you do have some sense of who they are, it is true. They are married and shall live happily ever after. Yes. Okay. Vegan dumb. <laughs> what? And, and happy vegan dumb. And happy vegan dumb indeed. <laughs> so, and uh, that's pretty cool, huh? Yes. I, cool. I have to say, I, I kind of thought it was coming, but I was a little surprised. Of course. A little surprised. Yeah. So that's one other announcement. Yes. And our other announcement is that our t-shirts should be showing up at Vegan Freak headquarters tomorrow. Tuesday tomorrow. Yes. Tuesday the 28th. If um, Universal Package Destroyers does not somehow destroy them or send them to the wrong house. Yeah. Well, they're usually pretty good about sending things to our place. UPS is good. DHL, they suck. Yeah. Fuck you, DHL. <laughs> so uh, we hopefully get them tomorrow. And then ho- by Wednesday, we should have... Th- a uh, web page up where you can purchase your vegan freak t-shirts. Absolutely. What a great holiday gift. <laughs> <laughs> for yourself or for others. That's right. And uh, we're going to have uh, discounted prices for subscribers. Yeah, we will. And uh, we will we will make the page exclusive to subscribers for a couple days, probably yeah. three days or so. Mm-hmm. So probably Wednesday, we'll put, put up the page. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we'll give it for subscribers only. Okay. And let them have at it. All right. And then after that, we'll open it for everybody. Okay. So subscribers, keep that in mind. Vegan Freak t-shirts coming down the pike. A unisex version and a, and a very attractive. Very attractive unisex version and a very attractive girly shirt version. Yes. I think I'm going to wear a girly shirt. <laughs> mm. To show off your curves. If you could see... You, you can't see me right now. It's a shame you can't because I, I am... I'm, You're tweaking your nip. I, no, I'm not tweaking them. I'm, oh, okay. I, I'm kind of feeling myself in a very <laughs> sexy way. You don't know what you're missing out there. If only, you know what, you know, this is the weird thing about radio. I can't see the thousands of you that are listening. Mm-hmm. And if I could, I would never do what I'm doing right now. This is true. <laughs> it could be a good thing. Then. You don't know. We could be podcasting naked. It could be. But we aren't. No. It'd be, be too, too cold. It'd be too cold. <laughs> uh, anyway, so a t-shirt soon. Ass Hats and Angels. I didn't, Richard. Yay! Yay! Um, what else? I think that's all for announcements. That's all for announcements. Okay. Moving on. All right. Um, I think what we're going to do now is have we these annoying things from the media comes f- from Newsweek this week. Newsweek is so. I think we just keep the subscription so we can always bust on it. Yeah, probably. Um, 
But anyway, it's got, you know, their holiday gift guide. Yay! And it is so not vegan. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, and actually, Bob ripped these out this week. Okay, this is the page of Fashion for Her. Okay. Starts off with uh, freshwater, pearl, abalone, and crystal dropped earrings. Oh, wait. Um, oh, uh, okay. I'm coming. You're, okay. Not vegan. There we go. All right. For only $345. Um, a very dead jacket, gray fur coat, and it looks like rabbit. Not vegan. Your your death for the low low price of four thousand seven hundred and fifteen dollars. Uh, okay, the top that's vegan. Uh, scarf one hundred percent baby alpaca. Not vegan. Yes. Not vegan. Not vegan. Uh, a mink and leather fur bracelet. Not vegan. Uh, cashmere gloves. Not vegan. A red leather wallet. Not vegan. A burgundy mohair bag. Not vegan. And black leather boots. Not vegan. Now, that is like the most not vegan outfit I have not ever vegan. heard of. <laughs> and the pants, probably wool, they don't say. This is but, in the gift guide, too. Yeah. It's like fashion for her. It's I mean, just absolutely disgusting. Okay, number one, right? All the species is bullshit aside. The fur, the leather, the mohair, the baby alpacas. Baby alpacas. I know. Come on, people. Baby alpacas. Baby motherfucking alpacas. Okay. Baby alpacas. All that stuff aside. This shit costs a lot of money. I know. I mean, that entire outfit is probably like ridiculous. Okay. The earrings, 345 Mm -hmm. U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. Earth, U.S. Earth dollars. (laughs) The jacket, $4,715. So what we're already above five grand there. The top four sixty six, mm-hmm. so fifty five hundred. The scarf three twenty five, fifty eight hundred. The fur cuff three hundred. So we're at uh, what's that sixty one hundred. The gloves fifty. So you know basically still sixty. Wallet is another fifty eight from Banana Republic at that. Uh, keychain one hundred and twenty five dollar motherfucking keychain. <laughs> now come on, are you really that bourgeois? Do you really need $125? Does anyone need 100 This is like that guy who had the umbrella stand made out of gold in his house. Mm-hmm. The CEO of Tyco International. Mm-hmm. He was mis- – wasn't it that – wasn't it him? Yeah, I think so. Or was so. it Adelphia? Uh, one, one of these of just, one yeah. of these fat corporate corporate pigs. Uh, oh, th- species is terminology. Yes, yes, yes. Fat corporate cats. Uh, mm. No. Capitalist Assholes? bloodsuckers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> capitalist blo- Another one of these capitalist bloodsuckers um, who had a $16,000 <laughs> gold umbrella stand in his house. Yeah. You know, like Lewis Black said, some of us have already have an umbrella stand in our house. It's called the bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, point is, it, this is a very expensive outfit. And, you know, Jenna, I love you dearly, but there is no way on God's green earth I would ever spend Seven, eight, or nine thousand dollars on an outfit for you. Good. For I certainly hope not. Because I know if I did, it'd be the last thing I ever did. <laughs> and especially would... not full of dead animals. Well, I, you know, this I've is just—it's just, it's just so, it's disgusting to me that in a mainstream magazine like Newsweek, they're pushing fur. Yep. And they have this other page too. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one is the splurges. Under the splurges, it's the Epsi clutch. So beautiful, she carried around the house. Do we mention it's made of brown mink and chartreuse satin? And has a snake brooch. Santa baby. $1,050. From www.christianlubouton.fr. I don't speak French, but I'm guessing <laughs> if I were in a cafe somewhere smoking, that's how I would say it. Christian, in case you want to go to the website and tell them how much they suck. C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-L-O-U-B-O-U-T-I-N.fr. I should think like a better thing to do to tell Newsweek how much they suck. That's a good idea, too, because they do suck. Yes, and I'm sure Newsweek.com is probably their website. Uh, so, yeah, tell them. Tell them all they suck. They suck. <laughs> they suck. Tell them Not vegan. For pushing fur. And especially, right. I mean, it's so frivolous. It's so disgusting that, you know, that purse, $1,000, A, $1,000 for a purse. Who the fuck needs a $1,000 purse? You made it, I don't care what it's made out of. Yep. And to me, made out of a mink, it's just, it's just, ugh. Oh. All right. <laughs> we both need to center ourselves all here, right sister jenna Makes me angry me too right this is the thing though i mean it's frustrating to live day to day in the world when you get so frustrated by like things everybody else thinks is normal are normal mm-hmm. you know I, that's one of the things i think that's most frustrating about being vegan is that as you go through day day by day through the world you see these things that are so problematic to you as a vegan but that everybody else sees as completely normal yeah, I it's mean, that's really why we played the thing at the beginning of the, the podcast. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Is, yeah, we are, you know, sort of awakened to consciousness, and therefore we are the freaks because we see what really happens, and we decide to do something about it. Yep. And that makes us the freaks. It does make us the freaks. And we think that 
your vegan freedom is a complex gift that should be embraced. Indeed. So if you are a vegan, and I know a lot of vegans out there are very proud to be vegan, so proud that they're willing to tell everyone in the, in the world about it. That's why we have a radio show. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think some vegans are vegan, and they're a little shy about their veganism. And I think... I'm not saying you should jam it down people's throats, but I am saying that you should never hide from it. You should never back down. It is an essential part of you, and you should embrace it and love it. Be proud of your freakdom. Be proud of it. Mm -hmm. You know? And I think, actually, that, you know, some people have given a shit for using the term freak. Uh, I think in a world that is as species as the world is that we live in today, we will, for quite a long time, be freaks. And I think that we need to, we need to recognize that because that is a point of departure that we have with the rest of the society. We need to emphasize that point of departure and use our veganism as kind of a lived expression of abolitionism in our day-to-day -day lives yeah preach it amen there you go <laughs> amen brother torres so <laughs> that's my little rant uh not really a rant that's my little point idea whatever mm -hmm. you call it mm -hmm. but i think it's good okay so um last week on the show we had someone i forget whether it was an email or voicemail um, who said they're, you know, not quite vegan yet. And we'd ask this person to, you know, to say, you know, what could we do to make you go vegan? What is it stopping it you? It was a voicemail from Crystal. Oh, voice okay. Well, we didn't hear from Crystal, but we heard from two other people. Okay. <laughs> Good. Who are vegetarians and who aren't quite there contemplating it and have some, some stumbling blocks. So, sure. So, uh, shall I read the email first and then we'll play the voicemail and then we'll talk about both of them. Do How's it. That? Okay, do so it. So this is email from Anne. Um, she said, in the last podcast, Crystal mentioned that she was still vegetarian, and you asked uh, what you needed to do to get her to cross over to the vegan side. So I thought I'd tell you what I need. I'm a vegetarian and far closer to being vegan since starting to listen to you guys. Well, that's good. So you've made some steps. Yay. Yay. First, I need some more quick and uh, vegan quick and dirty meals. Things that I can pick up on the way home from school. They are hard to find at a reasonable cost in my new home province of Alberta. Oil and Beef Central in Canada. Well, we uh, do like have Texas. some. Yeah, we do have listeners in very unfriendly places. We do indeed. Uh, vegan unfriendly, I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure Alberta is quite a friendly place in general, but yeah. I meant vegan unfriendly. Okay. okay. <laughs> and we do have listeners in Alberta. Okay. Good recovery. All right, good. Second, help me get past my love for cheese. I know why it's not vegan to eat it, but I still crave it. Milk and ice cream were easy to give up, admittedly in part because they do bad things to my stomach. And third, convince me that milk chocolate is the devil. I hate dark chocolate. It makes me gag, but I love milk chocolate. I have made huge steps since I started listening to you guys in September. By August, my past vegetarianism was slipping, but now even my vegetarian classmates think I am strict. But I still have changes to make, like not craving cheese all the freaking time. Anyway, there's my two cents. Great podcast. Keep up the good work. Profanities and all. Oh, we will be profane. <laughs> if nothing else, you can count on our oh, profanity. Yeah. <laughs> it blows in like a very strong wind. Uh, and here's a voicemail on the same topic. The David one, yeah? Mm -hmm. Hey, vegan freaks. This is David Michael Cunningham, a cult author and vegetarian. I'm calling in because you had recently asked on a podcast, what can we do to get you to become vegan or something to that effect? Um, I've been a vegetarian for almost seven years now, and I've been contemplating veganism for about two or so, and for the most part, I have been eating uh, vegan as much as I am able to. Now, you, m you may ask, well, what do you mean able to, you know, just do it? Um, a few of the reasons why I've yet to 100% become vegan is because of the fact that sometimes I think I am eating vegan and I don't know because of mysterious ingredients and such. But one of the bigger things, um, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but one of the bigger things for me is eating out. Um, because of my work schedule, this and that, I have found that it's fairly difficult to find vegan food um, when I'm out um, doing fast food. I love Subway. Subway is my favorite um, restaurant, but a lot of times the vegan bread <laughs> is out, and so I have to grab a salad. Um, there's other times that I eat at restaurants, and they may not have a vegan selection or the wait staff or even the cooking staff doesn't know if it's vegan or not even though you have to explain what veganism is. Um, another thing and this kind of is about the whole hidden ingredient thing is uh, about a week ago or so I picked up a can of fruit cocktail and my omni friend was like whoa 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 what are you doing you can't eat that. I'm like well what do you mean? I <laughs> think it's just for you know fruit cocktail. I'm like don't you know what makes the um, cherries red? And I'm like, what? He's like, 
yeah, it's it. They they grind up insects and make it red. You know, and I thought it was a whole like another one of those earth abate thing. Um, I was looking. He's like, it's Carmen. Car- Everybody knows that Carmen had dried up insects. My like, Carmen. So I look on the ingredient. Sure enough, C A R M I N E. Like whatever. So I buy this stuff and I go home. Well, be- due to my nature, I happen to use a lot of reference books and things of that sort. So I look it up. Sure as anything. Um, Carmen is made from dried, um, I believe it's pronounced, cochineal um, insects. And it's out there. It's not like the earth abate myth. And, and I, was kind of, I was kind of devastated uh, because there's just these, all these little things um, that, <laughs> wow, I, I don't know about. And it's frustrating because even trying to eat as a vegetarian, sometimes I get duped and I don't know about it. Um, to, what I'd almost need to become 100% vegan is to have like a little vegan freak guide walking around with me, being uh, my guide, saying, "Hey, don't eat that. You can eat this. Hey, you should think about this restaurant because it's good." And if I had a little vegan freak guide around with me for about two months or so, I'm pretty sure I'd be pretty good, um, unless I, of course, accidentally ingest things. Um, I love you guys' this podcast. Um, thank you very much for providing the information that you do. Keep up the good work. All right. So, well, how should we? What, what order should we answer those in? Well, there's a lot of things there. Okay. Um, let's go with well, let's go with the cheese first. Okay, we'll go with the cheese first. All right. There's a book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hate to be sh- shamelessly self-promotional, but this is my show, so I'm going to promote my book. <laughs> <laughs> there's a book called Vegan Freak: Being Vegan in a Non-Vegan World. And we wrote the book largely for people who are in the position of both of these folks who have email and called. And I'm not trying to tell you this to, to sell the book because I'm actually surprised at how many of these we've sold, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm, I'm just telling you this because we wrote the book not to make money on it, really, but actually to get people to go vegan. So uh, I'm, I'm telling you this because we wrote the book. We have a lot of things in the book about how to go vegan, how to break loose. You know, yeah. and how it's, to move beyond. it's the kind of thing that we would have wanted when we first became vegan, like a guide to helping you. OK, this is what you need to know about in order to be vegan. If you're already vegan, I mean, you're not going to find a ton of things in here that you don't already know. Mm-hmm. Um, not to say that you may not find it entertaining, funny and or oh, wait, what was the word on Amazon? That someone used. Fuck. I can't remember. <laughs> uh, uh, it was negative. Pomp- yeah. No, pompous. pompous. No, I believe someone called us pompous. Well, we are point. pompous. <laughs> um, fuck. Smug. Ah, Smug. yes. Mug. Yes, that's what comes. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen South Park? That's what comes uh, out of the back of your uh, your Prius. Out of your Prius. <laughs> no offense. I know we have listeners and subscribers <laughs> who are driving their Prius or whatever you call them. Uh, anyway, I, I just I want to say that for those of you that aren't quite yet vegan, I understand your predicament. Um, for a long time, I too kicked around the idea of veganism. At various times, I would put it off, or I wouldn't think about it, or. I would find excuses for myself not to do it. You know, I would think, oh, it's inconvenient, I'll do it later. Or I know I should probably do it, but I don't have time now and I don't really want to think about it now. Uh, But finally, one day, for some reason, something kicked me in the ass and I decided I I had no choice but to go vegan. And um, I decided that on that day that the only way that I was really going to go vegan was to just do it. You know, I decided one day, I said, next day, tomorrow, I'm going to be a vegan, Mm -hmm. you know? And I told Jenna, and she was like, yeah, maybe we should do that. So, you know, we talked about it for a little while, but then we decided that there was a day where we were just going to do it. Mm-hmm. And that, in, in addition to reading other things, has led to what we promote as the cold tofu approach. Now, other people have other ideas about how to go vegan. I think the cold tofu approach is a very good way to do it. And I'm not just saying it because I wrote about it in this book. But I thought we would do a little reading from the book of Bob and Jenna. <laughs> Chapter 1, page 6. Okay. Under going vegan, the cold tofu approach, we have written the following. If you are an ovo lacto vegetarian who isn't yet a vegan and you're looking for advice for going vegan, our advice is simple. Stop eating animal products today and give it three weeks before you decide that you must go back to eating dairy and eggs. If your commitment to animals is strong, is three weeks without cheese that much to give for the cause? Three weeks isn't much when you think about it. It's just 21 quick days. That's seven days fewer than it took zombies to take over the UK and 28 days later. Or if you prefer cheesy movies, that's seven fewer days than it took the character that no talent Sandra Bullock played to get clean in 28 days. 21 days is less time than you'd have to spend as a contestant on the average crappy reality TV show. Do you have a tattoo? If you do, it took your tattoo longer than 21 days to heal. Point is, 21 days 
isn't that much, but it is enough time for you to prove to yourself that life is easy to live without animal products, and trust us, it is. Going cold tofu uh is actually easier than weaning yourself off of animal products by gradually reducing the amount you eat over time. To take an example, let's say you really love cheese, and this one is written for all of you cheese lovers out there. In your mind, you imagine that life without your beloved cheese would be like life without sunny days, cute puppies, and chocolate, or in Bob's case, sunny days, cute puppies, and cold beer. If you decide to phase it out by eating only a little each day, you're actually giving the thing you're working to consume less and less of even more power. If you plan on phasing out, if you plan on phasing out cheese over three or four months, you'll eventually look forward to even the tiniest bit of it as if it were some reward. On the other hand, if you go cold tofu, you may tremble and suffer like an addict and withdraw for a day or two, but after that the suffering will decrease. By day 20, cheese might even look nasty to you, or perhaps you'll be a lifelong non-cheesing cheeseaholic. So the point the point that we're trying to make there is that you need to, I think the best way to do it, really, is to recognize it's difficult and to know that in, in it being difficult, you just need to put the cheese down and walk away from it and decide you're not going to do it. Indeed. What do you think? I agree. Because um, in one of our early shows, um, we read a report on how casein, which is the protein in cheese, is addictive because it has properties that make you feel good when you eat it. And be- and milk and ice cream aren't the same way because in cheese, it's concentrated. Right? So cheese is more addicting than milk or other, it, other it's dairy things. casomorphines in it. Yes, casomorphines. And they actually have a physiological design, right? Mm-hmm. The idea is to get the young calf coming back to the mother. Yeah. So it's got that, it's got that component, that yeah. natural component to it. But you need to recognize that you're also... You know, like the calf coming back to the cheese mother. <laughs> and at a certain point, you just got to cut yourself off. Cheese is the hardest thing for people. And yeah. I actually, believe it or not, used to love cheese. I wrote part of my dissertation on cheese. I look at cheese now, and I'm disgusted by it. Yeah. Well, one of the other things that also gets concentrated in cheese is pus. <laughs> because we also did a show um, way back when about pus in milk and how because of the way the animals are raised... Um, the pus cells and all the stuff that comes from their having an, an infection gets in the milk, and they allow a certain percentage of it, and it's usually pretty high. Yep. Um, and so that all gets concentrated in your cheese, too. Um, not to mention that casein has been found of links to cancer. Um, just read the China study. Yeah, by T. Colin Campbell. Actually, mm-hmm. that book argues that casein is a very strong cancer promoter. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Above all of that, if you're a vegan or you're contemplating veganism because of animal rights reasons, milk and dairy is probably even worse for the cows than beef. I think so, too. Right? In terms of suffering. In terms of the suffering. that I mean, they take away the calf so that we can take its milk. The calf goes to veal. Right. I mean, there is no way around it. The calf goes to veal, and the calf is just killed within months right? and either suffers or is killed within sometimes days. Sometimes one or two days. Right. That those hungry man veal. I mean, for those of you who oh, live yeah. outside the U.S., you know, yeah. uh, you, these are frozen dinners you mm-hmm. can buy. And there's a veal version, I think. I haven't. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is too. That's the cheapest veal that that comes, you know, within a day or two after a calf mm-hmm. is born. Or it goes to dog food. Or dog food, indeed. Yeah. And the the cows are, you know, are are kept pregnant in order to be, you know, to be. Giving milk, that's the only way they give milk is when they have babies. So they're artificially inseminated. You know, they're kept pregnant. They're kept in these horrible conditions, shot up with antibiotics and hormones. And, you know, that's what goes into your milk. All that suffering and all that hor- those horrible chemicals go into the milk. And it's, it's just there's no, there's no reason for the cows to have to suffer for that, for something that's designed for baby calves. I agree. Not designed for us. Well, and that's the thing. I think part of what it is is that um, ultimately – some people are in different, everybody's in a different place. And I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm trying to have, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to understand that. And I want people to think about that. I know a lot of the old long-term vegans out there are yelling at me, like, stop being so, you know, <laughs> so soft, right? <laughs> but people are in different places. And I think that we need to recognize that. And, but I also think that regardless of where you are, you have to recognize that, you know, animals are, are suffering for, if you're eating animal products, mm-hmm. animals are suffering for that product. Mm-hmm. And, at a certain point, your knowledge that animals are suffering for that product needs to outweigh your convenience mm-hmm. and your desire for taste. And for me, it was a matter of having a clear conscience. Mm-hmm. It was completely a matter of having a clear conscience. Like, you know, I know that it, it was nothing about anybody else at all. I mean, not other people. It was about me and my relationship with animals when I, when I came down to it. I thought, I want to be able to look at animals and have a clear conscience about it. 
you know? And when I'm, when I'm alone, I want to be able to have a clear conscience about what I'm eating. When I'm out, I want to have a clear conscience about what I'm eating. So in a sense, I, I felt like it was what I had to do in order to be honest to myself and honest to the way I want to live in the world. Mm-hmm. I'm speaking from the heart here. Indeed. No, but it's true. Yeah. And I think that for some people, it's easy to look to forget about that. Mm-hmm. Because I think ultimately the best reasons for going vegan are ethical reasons. I mean, health, health veganism, it, I mean, yeah, it's good for you, right? But mm-hmm. I feel like health veganism is really a more like strict vegetarianism. I, th- I think of veganism as, as a lifestyle that encompasses a compassion for other beings. Indeed. And that way you think also, also about leather and fur and all of those other items that wouldn't, you know... You could still own those and be a health food vegan. I mean, you wouldn't, I would say, strict vegetarian, not vegan, but whatever. Sure. Anyway, semantics. Okay. Um, but to curb your cravings, okay, uh, don't eat, like we said, go cold tofu. Don't Just decide on a day and do it. Indeed. And get a copy of the Uncheese Cookbook. Yeah. I don't know, though. I, I actually think that, I mean, I want to disagree with you. Okay. Is that all right? That's fine. You can disagree with me. I, I think that the best thing to do is just stay away from cheese or cheese substitutes. Just get away from it. Because if you eat cheese and you go and make a cheese substitute, you're going to be disgusted with the cheese substitutes. I mean, I'm not going to lie to anybody. That's true. There is only one sufficient cheese substitute I have ever had (laughs) that I thought, wow, this is the kind of thing that I need to sell to people who aren't vegan yet but want to be. And that was Cheesley. Yeah. That was just absolutely goddamn amazing. And right now you can only get it in the U.K., Right. That was the only one. But I, I would say if you're going to try to leave cheese alone, leave cheese alone. Step away from it. Don't even make the substitutes. We didn't make the substitutes no, for a we long didn't, time. Yeah. Step away from it. Try something new, you know, mm-hmm. and just walk away. I'm wondering how much cheese do people eat? Like, I forget. It's been years since I've touched <laughs> the stuff, but like, cheese is so hard. Do people eat that much of it? Yeah. Huh. I mean, I mean, it's a lot easier to find things loaded with cheese in a restaurant than it is True. to find things without it. So we need to. We need to keep, we need to kind of focus this a little more. So. Okay. Go Sorry. Ahead. No, it's all good. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, you're t- after three weeks is one of the other reasons why we suggested that in our book is that your tastes do change. You start, you lose your cravings for it and you yeah. start realizing that, oh, wow, things really do taste a lot better without all the grease and pus. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, and they do. They you're, do. And the, the weird thing is, is that, um, you know, I've, I've had accidents, not where I've purposefully eaten things, but where I have had things served to me that had cheese on them not cheese but usually cream or Mm. milk or some butter or something and i can really taste it now Mm -hmm. and it's kind of disgusting it's gross so um i know for a lot of you out there who are still eating cheese a lot of vegetarians you you find what i'm saying absolutely completely dumbfounding that anyone would not like cheese you know that anyone could possibly move to that that point but i have to tell you you know my name is bob (laughs) And I used to eat cheese. No, I, I, I did used to. And I understand that you like it, but I think ultimately you just got to put it down and walk away from it. That's mm-hmm. the best advice I can give you. Because I, I just think if you keep phasing out, phasing out, phasing out, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Just try it. Three weeks for now. If you care about animals, three weeks is not that much time. Not at all. It not really all. isn't. Um, and the same thing I mean, for the milk chocolate. If you don't like dark chocolate, there are some rice milk and soy milk uh, chocolates and out there. And almond milk chocolate. Almond milk chocolate. Um, and you can... You can try these. They're not going to taste the same, but after a while, you don't notice the difference. Honestly. It's time for us to plug our, our, our advertisers over at podcast.vegangreek.com, like Cosmos and Food Fight. Indeed. Both of whom have several very nice substitutes mm-hmm. that I've eaten and gone, wow, that's pretty good. That's really good. They have got, uh, Cosmos has a lot of chocolate, and doesn't mm-hmm. don't they? Yes. Yeah, they do. do. Mm-hmm. And uh, Food Fight, it's got some junk food, so you can always find that kind of stuff. And they're surprisingly good substitutes. Yes. And unfortunately, in Canada, it's going to cost you a little more to get them from the U.S., but I'm sure there, there's got to be some place in Canada to get them. I don't know. But people, <laughs> I mean, Ida lives in, you know, in Canada, and she always has stuff shipped, and That's it's true. not you know, yeah, no, exorbitantly no, just, uh, uh, you know, yeah. insane. But Of course, the best soy milk chocolate I've ever had is also only in the U.K. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. You guys you, have you, it really good over there. You do. I'm <laughs> jealous. So anyway, let's, let's step away from that. Uh, and I'll tell you what. If you want to talk to us about this, you can email us and we'll email you back. We're, we're willing to help you. We're willing to help any of you out there yes. to do this. Mm-hmm. I can't guarantee you that we'll respond to your email very fast. We try, but sometimes we get a little overwhelmed. And uh, we're, we want to help you go vegan because, you know, we, uh, contrary to popular belief, we don't get a toaster from, from <laughs> vegan headquarters, you know. Uh, I just think it's the, one of the best things you can do. I think it's the best thing you can do right now, today, any of you can do. 
to prevent animal cruelty. Yes. Okay. Okay. To the voicemail. Yes. Well, uh, we don't have a vegan guy to go around with you, <laughs> a, vegan. a person, but we do have books that yeah, can help you. Absolutely. Um, you could, again, plug our book. You get a copy <laughs> of Vegan Free because we do go through the types of restaurants that tend to have more vegan food than that's others. Right. Um, and it depends on where you are. You can always go for Chinese and you can pretty much find something that they'll yeah. cook you vegan. Because um, the big thing to watch out for in Chinese food is egg. Well, we go through the whole in the book. Right. We talk about the different things one needs to watch out for in exactly. all the different restaurants. Exactly. So, you know, watch out for egg. Watch out mm-hmm. for fish in Japanese restaurants. Things like that. And so we give you a lot of advice on those. Right. And in some restaurants, you do have to be a little more pushy. Yeah. Right. And say maybe have them cook you something separate, or you know, ask. Okay, this isn't on the menu. Can you cook me X? You mm-hmm. know, just maybe some pasta. If you have to go out, maybe some pasta, simple pasta. You know, with olive oil and garlic. Who knows? You know, you can ask for things. You have to be a little pushier than some people are comfortable with. But you know what? It's a restaurant. They're supposed to be catering to people. Actually, that's really interesting you mentioned that because um, a friend of ours just told me that a new Indian restaurant opened near here. Hmm. And she's a vegan. She went there and she said that they were very accommodating. Oh, sweet. That they were really cool about not having ghee and all that stuff. Oh, excellent. That's so. good to know. But anyway, you may have to be a little, you may have to be explained to people and be nice. and. Mm-hmm. Especially if you go somewhere often. I think they're going to be willing to accommodate you. Yeah. And if they aren't, find another place. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I think it, it just comes down to that. Um, they would do it for people who are allergic. They would, mm-hmm. And they should do it for you. Mm-hmm. And I think that you just need to let them know what they need to be doing for you. And you could find a place that will make you some vegan stuff and just go there often. I mean, there's two pizza places here where we can go out to eat mm-hmm. and have vegan pizza. Mm-hmm. And they're totally cool with it. And yeah. this is in like rural America. Yeah, so, they don't even give us weird looks, which yeah, is cool. They're fine with it. So, <laughs> um, I think that's one thing. The other thing in the grocery stores, uh, what I've learned about being vegan is that those first couple weeks are difficult because you, you don't really know right away what all the ingredients are that you mm-hmm. need to look out for. And you have some fuck-ups. You know, you slip up. But it's not the end of the world. You know, you learn the, a couple things you need to watch out for, and then you know. And you just read the labels, and you and you have a sense of what is and is not vegan. Right, and then you don't buy it again. Right? So I found the first couple of weeks of being vegan a little difficult when I was trying to, you know, kind of religiously avoid these these little ingredients. If you slip up, it's not like the end of the world, right? No. So no. accidents are are different than like, oh my god, I have to have a hamburger, and I'm going to, and you're going to eat it. <laughs> exactly. It's a lot different. So I think it's okay, you know, give yourself some slack. You know, it's not like mm. it's not. Uh, it, it's not such a big deal in that way. But I, I also think that if you if you learn what those couple ingredients are, you can very easily avoid them. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a book. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to mention the book. Do it. <laughs> uh, a to Z, uh, Guide to Vegan Ingredients. Or if a, you're, to a to Z. A to Z, and you're in other countries. Um, and we, there's also a podcast version that's a lot easier to carry with you um, of Animal Ingredients A to Z. If you have, a po- if you if have, you have a, an iPod. It, it's not a podcast. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. An it's iPod, a, an iPod version. Yeah, it's a little, like... If you go into the notes section on your iPod, mm-hmm. you can browse it that way. Yeah, so it has to be one of the newer iPods. So it is a little guide you can actually carry. If you have an that's iPod, true. you can take it to the grocery store with you, and it's yeah. like fits in your pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's on our blog. I will link to that in the show notes if I remember. Okay. So. All right, yep. and we also have uh, should put in some links. Uh, well, a, lot, a lot of people in our forum suggest is that you're having doubts. If you're not sure, go look at one of these websites that ch- uh, shows you what happens in dairy farms and to remind yourself. Even if you're already vegan and you're like, "Oh, I'm really hungry for cheese," remind yourself why you're doing this. Absolutely, right? and it really helps because it does. a lot. Of, I think a lot of times people go from being you know vegetarian to not is because they forget why they went vegetarian in the first place. I think, I think so, it's too. it's sometimes important to remind yourself. On Animal Voices, actually, there was a very interesting discussion over the last two shows with um, Ray Sikora, I guess her name is, talking about ex-vegetarians mm-hmm. and why they become ex-vegetarians. And uh, I recommend you all listen to that if, you, if you're interested. I mean, it's a great show, great radio show. Anyhow, I listen to Animal Voices quite regularly. But mm-hmm. um, it was interesting because I think she raised the point that a lot of people tend to be a little distant from their choices. Mm-hmm. You know? Indeed. And I think it's important to remind yourself why you make the choices and to feel good about those choices. Because what happens, what happened for me when I was a vegetarian, I mean, I'll tell you, I, confession time with Bob. <laughs> I, I was vegetarian for a long time and I think I forgot why I wanted to be a vegetarian for a while. And that led to me doing things that were not vegetarian, you know? Mm-hmm. And whereas now I'm a vegan and I'm always doing vegan stuff and reading vegan things and doing vegan podcasts and running vegan forums and all that <laughs> stuff i i can never forget why i went vegan mm-hmm. and it, it, it's a much bigger part of my life than vegetarianism was but i think we become habituated to the way we live day to day and we tend to distance ourselves from 
what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think in that distancing, we lose a sense of why we were originally so interested and so invigorated by it. And I think it's important not to lose that. I agree. I agree. And if you don't know any other vegans, sometimes finding other vegans on the internets can help. On the nets. On the nets. Join a forum. You know, there are different forums out there for different kinds of people. There are a whole variety of forums. Our forums, I will say, you know, they aren't for everyone, but they might be for you. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> They're closed, actually, until December anyhow. But uh, our forums are really not for everyone. No. You know, I don't, some people, it just, you know, we just have a different, the community there is a little weird for some people. Vegan represents a great forum. Mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. that some people find a little more welcoming than our forum. Mm -hmm. uh, veggie boards, uh, people find that. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> people find veggie boards quite welcoming, but a lot of people, a lot of vegans I know who go there, there are a lot of omnivores mm -hmm. on there, and so mm -hmm. sometimes they find that that is a, a, a difficult dynamic for them. Right. But it's a great board. There are, there are tons of people on there mm -hmm. and tons of resources. All of those boards are great. So, you know, get on the internets and, and find some community. Not necessarily ours. Yeah, could find, be anyone's. Yeah, find something that, that yeah. works for you. Veggie boards, vegan represent, vegan freak forums. What other ones am I missing? There's the vegan forum, but I don't. I haven't been there in a long time. So anyway, yeah. That's, That's about right. it. <sighs> okay. I'm tired. <laughs> so I want to go make chili. <laughs> I think that's about it for then our our portion of the show. Yeah. Did, uh, what? What do we? Oh, we have one more voicemail. Oh, that's right. We have a funny voicemail. Okay, here it is. Okay. <laughs> oh, hey, uh, Bob and Jenna. Um, this is a junk dog. Don't tell no one. Shh. But um, hey, is Aqua Teen Hunger Force vegan? Because <laughs> like, for our lock is French fries. But shake is a milkshake. But it could be like one of those McDonald's chemical milkshakes, so he could be vegan. <laughs> but um, Meatwad is straight up a ball of meat, man. And I'm guessing <laughs> it's probably ground beef. So it's probably like some of those unhappy Cali cows that, that made him. So I'm going to keep watching no matter what because this shit's funny. But, I mean, think about that. Is is Aqua Teen Hunger Force vegan or not? I don't think it is, man. Do you... You tell me if I'm just overthinking this. All right. Thanks, guys. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a see, drunk dial or a high dial? <laughs> I'm kidding. But see, you don't want to eat meat wad. That's right. Meat wad. Or you don't want to drink shake. You don't eat meat wad. <laughs> I love meat wad. So, so it could be thinking of watching them could be vegan because then you don't, cause you don't want to eat them. Yeah, that's right? true. I, I watch. I, I, you, I watch Aqua Teen Hunger Force all the really, time. It's really funny. If it's not vegan, well then, fine. <laughs> Come after me. I'm not. I'm not vegan. I think it is vegan. Why not? Sure. You're not eating them, right? right. You're not drinking the shake. <laughs> Frylock is cool. Yeah. I think Carl's not vegan though. If you want to talk. Yeah. About <laughs> hey there, Fry Guy. <laughs> I love Carl. He's hilarious. If you have, don't watch Aqua Teen Hunger Force, we're really sorry. <laughs> yeah. This is a show that has very specific interests. All, throughout. all the oh, vegans yeah. are probably bored to death by the last 20 minutes. <laughs> and we <True>. apologize. <laughs> we'll return to our normal format shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, and anybody who doesn't watch Aqua Teen is probably like, huh? <laughs> but you should watch it. It's funny and very it strange. Funny. It's bizarre. And, oh, Patrick, actually. Um, speaking of Patrick, he had this great idea and actually uh, helped us, will help us hook up this idea where he's going to do a giveaway for new vegans. So, cool. Yeah. We hooked that up. We'll talk about that next show. All right. It involves so, cookbooks, yes? It involves new cookbooks. Sweet. For, for new vegans. All right. So that's a way of, uh, that's Patrick's way of trying to get you into a brand new veganism today. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> How about we move into our interview? Okay. It's good because I got to pee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Once again. TMI? <laughs> No, it's you, you had to pee in the last show. Oh, yeah. Hey, but I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this what happens when you get old? I guess. I don't know. Don't you have to pee a lot? <laughs> I know. My dad pees a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Am I turning into my dad? <laughs> no! <laughs> I, and I only do this because I know they're listening. So my mom and dad, my, my mom's probably saying, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> so the interview um th we did an interview with with dr gregor yes and we sound if we sound a little bit distracted at the beginning oh, it's because the dogs God. were being horrendous they were being really bad 
Uh, I don't know why, but they were freaking out over something outside, and they were barking, and they wouldn't stop. And I think that distracted me during the interview, so yeah. I apologize. And then apologize. the phone got cut off, like, in the middle of the interview. <sighs> so it was we had some, we're having some problems. Yeah, but I think the interview still gets the main points yeah. across. Yeah. Um, Dr. Greger's book deals with the origins of the bird flu, how a pandemic might spread, why we need to be concerned about it, and how bird flu has its roots in the exploitation of animals. Mm-hmm. So that's a new book out from Lantern called Bird Flu. A Oh, I can't see it from across the room. Well, we talk about it yes. in, the, in the interview. So we'll let that interview roll, and uh, we'll be back after the interview. So enjoy. Here's Dr. Greger. Okay. It is our great pleasure to be here with my, Dr. Michael Greger. And uh, Dr. Greger is a physician, author, and internationally recognized professional speaker on a number of important public health issues. Dr. Greger has been invited to lecture at countless <coughs> universities, medical schools, and conferences around the world, including the Conference on World Affairs, the Bird Flu Summit, and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, many of you probably know that Dr. Greger is a general practitioner specializing in clinical nutrition and a founding member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He is author of Heart Failure, Diary of, Diary of a Third Year Medical Student, Carbophobia, The Scary Truth Behind America's Low Carb Craze, and his latest book, which we're going to talk about today, Bird Flu, A Virus of Our Own Hatching, as well as contributing to a number of other books on nutrition and food safety issues. Dr. Greger is a graduate of the Cornell University School of Agriculture and the Tufts University School of Medicine. And I also am a graduate of Cornell University Uh (laughs) Uh, from from a program that was in their agricultural college. Anyway, as Farm Sanctuary's chief medical investigator, Dr. Greger debated the National Cattlemen's Beef Association director before the FDA and was invited as an expert witness to defend Oprah Winfrey in the infamous meat defamation trial. Dr. Greger was featured on the Healthy Living channel promoting his latest DVD and honored to teach part of, of Dr. T. Colin Campbell's esteemed nutrition course at Cornell. Following his launch of AtkinsExposed.org, which is a great site, by the way, Dr. Greger resumed his busy speaking schedule promoting his last book, Carbophobia, published by Lantern Books. All proceeds he receives from the sale of his books, CDs, and DVDs are donated to charity. Dr. Greger is currently the Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States, helping forward their mission to create a humane and sustainable world for all animals, including people, through education, advocacy, and the promotion of respect and compassion. Dr. Greger is currently on a limited fall 2006 speaking schedule to promote his new book, Bird Flu, A Virus of Our Own Hatching. August 2006, he was honored to participate in a Department of Homeland Security pandemic influenza tabletop exercise. And today, we are honored to have Dr. Greger on the show, and I can take a breath now. (laughs) So, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, We we really do are interested in talking about bird flu. This is an amazing book um, that I've had the pleasure to... to, I haven't, unfortunately, been able to read the whole thing because I just got it last week. And it is uh, is an amazing book because you go through all of the different... All the different parts of bird flu from its uh, from its origins all the way up to kind of preparedness and uh, things like that. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about the book just to begin. Uh, yeah, I you know, uh, over the last 30 years, over 30 new diseases have emerged or reemerged at a rate really unprecedented in human history. You know, AIDS, SARS, Ebola, mad cow, bird flu, most of these new disease threats are coming from animals. You know, but we domesticated animals over 10,000 years ago. So, you know, in light of this current bird flu threat, I wanted to understand, you know, kind of why now? What has changed in recent years to bring this all upon us in hopes that if we can kind of undercover the key underlying causes for the emergence and spread of these new diseases, we may be able to do something about it. Okay. And uh, why, why now? Why is bird flu becoming a, a real issue now? Well, you know, bird flu viruses have existed harmlessly for millions of years, harmless to both birds and people. That's very important to understand. They start out harmless, but placed in extreme conditions, though, some of these viruses can mutate into a dangerous or what they call highly pathogenic form, like in the trenches of World War I, which may have led to the pandemic of 1918, which killed 50 million people. And in and, and, and that circumstance, there were millions crowded together in these stressful, unhygienic conditions. But from the point of view of this virus, those same trench warfare conditions exist today in every industrial chicken shed, in every industrial egg operation, you know, confined crowded, stressed, but by the billions, not just millions, like the soldiers of 1918. So what we're seeing today, actually, is really potentially even a more problematic situation than what we saw in 1918. And 
indeed, the virus that has come out of these conditions, H5N1, this mutant strain of avian influenza spreading out of Asia, currently has a human lethality exceeding 50%, meaning more than 50% of those that catch this disease die from it. That's, you don't even get a coin toss as to whether or not you live through it. Now, back in 1918, the worst plague in human history, killing more people in 25 weeks than AIDS has killed in 25 years, um, had a case mortality rate of only 2.5%, so a very, very low uh, mortality rate. But, I mean, considering it was influenza and spread around the world and infected billions of people, about half of humanity, even a minuscule mortality rate kills tens of millions of people. And now we have a virus killing over half of the people it infects. If this virus were to trigger a human pandemic and retain its human lethality, then it could really present an unprecedented human catastrophe. You know, one of the things I was really, uh, I found surprising when I had read your book was that you write in the book that the H5N1 virus uh, would likely target the young and the healthy, right? And that's, yeah. I mean, when people think of, uh, of the flu, they think of it killing the elderly and the infirm, but the average age of people dying right now from this virus is 19 years old. So really kind of the prime of life. Now, this is the same thing that happened back in 1918. The, the, the highest category of death was uh, age category was between 20 and 34 years of age. And the reason is we think now that we actually was able to recreate the 1918 virus and we can study currently the H5N1 virus, is that they produce what's called a, a cytokine storm. Basically, they, they, it's kind of an autoimmune reaction. The virus doesn't kill you. The virus triggers an over-exuberant immune reaction, and so your, your own body attacks your own lungs and kind of rips them to shreds, and you, you, your lungs fill up with fluid and you die. And, but on autopsy, ironically, your lung is completely free from virus. You win. Your immune system wins, but kind of in burning down the village in order to save it, unfortunately, you don't make it through it. So it's the people with the strongest immune systems, with the healthiest immune systems that are ironically most at risk. After about age 40, one's immune system starts to decline. And so from uh, this kind of uh, hyper-virulent pandemic strain, um, like back in 1918 or potentially H5N1, uh, you know, it would be those uh, in the really in the kind of prime of life that would be most at risk from this kind of pandemic disease. And in, in 1918, I would imagine the conditions are a lot different. I mean, you explained about World War One, but are, are conditions of modern living more apt to spread the virus quickly? Unfortunately, the, uh, the commercial airline travel basically, you know, can spread this virus anywhere in the world in 24-hour period. And so if it were to transform, to mutate into a strain that's easily transmissible from one person to the next, just like the regular flu, then we would expect it to spread very rapidly around the globe in a way that post-pandemic, you know, in previous pandemics, the virus was not able to do. And so we are particularly vulnerable um, and, uh, and unfortunately... Our uh, you know medical advances you know we we don't have the ventilator capacity we don't have enough antiviral treatment drugs we're really kind of back in kind of the 1918 situation except the virus would spread much more quickly. Yeah, I was when I was reading through the book one of the things I, uh, that really shocked me when I was reading it was that we would have all these difficulties we would probably be looking at a global economic collapse where this where this actually take on a pandemic you know proportions. Um, we would run into problems like not having enough places to bury people, not enough crematorium, uh, crematoria, things like that, that we never stop to think about. Maybe you could talk a little bit about those kinds of issues. Yes, indeed. I mean, what's what's called in, the, in kind of disaster medicine circles called the corpse management is, you know, we are not, we are not accustomed as a society to imagine, um, you know, to see our loved ones being, you know, uh, buried in mass graves. But unfortunately, we, the, the, the we would very quickly, we expect to be very quickly have our um, have our, our current system overwhelmed, and unfortunately we may indeed, um, at least in the short term, um, have to uh, bury people together only hopefully later to um, to rebury um, those casualties. But I mean, there's 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 all sorts of plans floating around from turning kind of roll you know ice roller skating rinks into um uh into kind of you know mass morgues uh, freezer trucks i mean the, the the concern is you know i mean how when you're kind of you have a system that's so overwhelmed where do you store the dead is is really a kind of a key issue interesting in in the united kingdom they've 
they've created these kind of uh, inflatable morgues, essentially, that, that can be kind of set up and moved around, um, which is kind of a, uh, a creative solution to the problem. But, um, and you know, this is not just a, it's not, so in addition to being kind of a public health issue, it really is a kind of psychologically, it's very important for people to feel that their loved ones are treated respectfully um, should they um, come down um, and uh, die from this illness. And so um, it's certainly a, a kind of key priority for public health officials to try to figure out what we are going to do um, when handling potentially tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of dead worldwide. So uh, I guess the one question that people out there who haven't read your book yet probably would have is, uh, is this an if or is this a when? I mean, if this happens, we could look at this, or this is probably going to happen. I mean, how how would you kind of come down on that? Well, the question is certainly not if, but when the next pandemic will strike. I mean, we do know there will be another pandemic, but no one knows when and no one knows how bad it'll be. But you know, with this with this H5N1 strain circulating in Asia with unprecedented human lethality, killing over half of its human victims, you know, up to 60 million Americans come down with the flu every year. What? if it suddenly turned deadly. You know, that's kind of what keeps everyone up awake at night. The possibility, however slight, that a bird flu virus like H5N1 could trigger a human pandemic. So we really need to take steps now as a society, as a country, to prepare for the next pandemic whenever it strikes. So what is the government doing right now to prepare? <laughs> Well, one of the things, it's uh, set up this kind of uh, public portal at pandemicflu.gov, pandemicflu.gov, which is really quite an excellent site. I mean, it's kind of evolved over the months. Uh, I think it went up uh, October 2005. So um, it's been up for a year and getting better and better. And it has these pandemic preparedness checklists for businesses, faith communities, uh, you know, uh, schools, all the way down to individual and family preparation. So what everyone can do and is urged to do by the Centers for Disease Control in terms of stockpiling weeks of essential goods and things um, to deal with the next pandemic. Uh, is there something the government should be doing that it's not doing? Well, I mean, there's this kind of uh, mother of all unfend, unfunded mandates. The federal <laughs> government has been very clear. Um, uh, Secretary Levitt has been surprisingly candid, saying, look, there will be no help from the federal government, essentially, since, you know, unlike uh, a disaster like Katrina, where we could flood New Orleans with supplies from the outside, there is no outside, really, with a pandemic situation. I mean, we can imagine every city, New Orleans, around the world, at the same time, there is no outside, by definition, of a pandemic. So really, we will all be dealing with the next pandemic really from a local level. Um, and so uh, and so that's where the funds need to be. That's where the preparation needs to be. And unfortunately, um, thanks to uh, kind of uh, Republican gubernatorial and presidential terms, we have really gutted our, um, our, our public health infrastructure on a local level. And so our county public health system is really struggling even now without a crisis. And so that's really where we need to bolster um, uh, the, uh, you know, kind of from a federal, from a, from, a, from a national level, that's where the funds really need to go. Um, in addition to the increasing vaccine uh, production capacity, some of these other things that, uh, that are already in motion. But that seems to be a kind of a key missing component is if it's all going to be done at a local level, the local level needs to have the funds to do it. So if we were in the, in the book, you have a section called Surviving the Pandemic. Uh, how will we survive it? Um, uh, the, the key to surviving the pandemic is really not to get infected in the first place, particularly if it's a virus like H5N1, if it retains any of its current mortality. I mean, if it's if it has 60 percent mortality, which is, you know, the current kind of 2006 mortality. I mean, you just cannot get infected with this virus in the first place. So I give tips in the book on how to do that. If one goes back to 1918, half the world was infected. Now, you can kind of think of that two ways. The half empty interpretation, if you will, is of an unthinkably contagious virus. I mean, you know, half the world infected, but the kind of half-full interpretation is, look, fully half of humanity escaped infection completely. And so that's really the key, although I do, of course, talk about how to, to, you know, take care of yourself or your family member if they do fall ill. But really the key is to not get infected in the first place. And 
One of the things that I think our, our listeners would be especially interested in is hearing about the aspects. I mean, you mentioned it sort of at the beginning of the interview. Um, since this is a virus of our own hatching, is like you say in the, the subtitle of the book, and it's, it's basically all comes down to our confinement of birds. And that's what's really, that's what's brought this all upon us. And there's been exponential, truly exponential increase in the number of bird flu outbreaks in the last decade, um, both uh, so in birds and also a corresponding increase in the transmission to human beings as well. We hear about H5N1, but since the emergence in 1997, four other chicken flu viruses have started infecting people at a rate unheard of in the annals of human medicine. What is going on? And uh, it seems to be this intensification of the of the uh, of the global poultry sector, the global poultry industry, we are exporting our kind of Tyson model of a westernized westernized industrial poultry production to the developing world, leading to you know, industrial scale commercial chicken farming. Really, a perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of super strains of influenza. You know, um, you know, back you know a hundred years ago, chickens were kind of pecking around the barnyard, but now. We cram tens of thousands of birds into these, you know, filthy football field-sized sheds to lie beak to beak in their own waste. Truly, just a breeding ground for disease. And is it basically? Can we do anything about this? <laughs> is there anything that you know we can? Is it too late to change the system? Well, unfortunately, um, well, I mean, the the United Nations is very clear that um, that uh, to prevent future outbreaks, we need to fight the role of what they call factory farming in the emergence and spread of dangerous bird flu viruses. Unfortunately, H5N1 has already been hatched, already spread and mutated into a more dangerous form. So to prevent future bird flu um, outbreaks, particularly these highly virulent types, um, we need to, to heed the advice of the United Nations and fight um, the industrialization of the global poultry sector. Um, we really need to reverse course away from confining birds by the billions under intensive confinement so as to lower our risk of being in this kind of precarious place in, in the future. Unfortunately, right now, um, we don't have the political will to make dramatic, drastic changes um, in the current uh, poultry sector, I'm afraid, and uh, changes will really only happen after in a post-pandemic situation. You know, it's kind of like Katrina where you just don't shore up the levees or you don't tend to shore up the levees until after the disaster. But in a post-pandemic world, if some of these predictions um, by, you know, really the leaders of the global um, uh, public health world come to light, then then humanity may, you know, really have to dramatically rethink um, how it treats their animals in general, particularly when it comes to um, birds raised for food. I think one of the more frustrating things is that we don't hear about that part of it in the news ever. I mean, the media doesn't really touch on it. They say, oh, we could have this great big bird flu, but it doesn't really talk about it. Yeah, these factory farms are truly a public health menace. You know, when you think of other um, foodborne diseases like mad cow disease, for example, if you don't want to get mad cow disease, you just don't eat beef or you don't get a blood transfusion from someone who ate beef. But, you know, with, uh, or, or, you know, these antibiotic resistant salmonella and chicken, et cetera, um, certain, you know, 76 million Americans come down with food poisoning every year. But look, if you don't want to get sick from these animal-borne bugs, you don't eat the animal-based foods. Um, and uh, hopefully there's not cross-contamination from the animal waste to your to plant-based foods, such as what presumably happened in the E. coli spinach situation. But, I mean, we have some control. Unfortunately, with bird flu, it doesn't matter um, from kind of a personal standpoint what one is eating in terms of reducing one's personal risk because if this virus were to become were to mutate into a transmissible form easily transmissible form between humans then we would get the disease just like we get the regular flu you know you know you know respiratory droplets or you know kind of getting infected from person to person then kind of birds are out of the picture so yes it matters what we eat in terms of you know supporting the current industrial system um, uh, but it's 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 less kind of what we individually eat and more how these birds were raised kind of on a blo- global scale. It's not enough for us to withdraw our support from the poultry industry. We really need to work as activists to, uh, to you know, as the United Nations has stated, combat the role of factory farming in the emergence of spread of these dangerous viruses. And so it's, it's, so it's really a call to action to, um, to really 
to work against the, this this um, this kind of industrial form of exploitation. And it seems to me that it's fallen out of the news just a little bit lately. I mean, is is it just me, or is it we're we're not talking about this as much anymore? I mean, your book just brought it up again, but. Is it just me, or is it? Or are we sort of forgetting about? <laughs> like, to, to me, it would think that the government would still be, you know, reminding people every once in a while <laughs> about, about well, what's it, going on. Yeah, it continues to kind of simmer in the news cycle. Unfortunately, I mean, there's just kind of not much new news. I mean, this new Fujian strain spreading out of China got reported this um, this month, but you know, it's basically the, the, the number of angles are kind of you know we're in the same situation we were. Um, almost a year ago, which is this simmering, you know, bird flu virus, unprecedented geographic spread around half the world, um, continuing to kill more birds, continuing to kill more people. But we're basically just waiting, keeping our fingers crossed that a pandemic strain won't arise. But unfortunately, at this point, you know, that's uh, almost all we can do in terms of kind of politically uh, acceptable solutions at this point. And so really what we have to do is not only um, work to prevent future outbreaks, but prepare, as uh, the CDC has encouraged us to do, within our own communities and neighborhoods and families to really prepare for the next pandemic. Excellent. Uh, You've also, uh, I've noticed, uh, done the unique step of putting this entire book on the web. Is that true? Yeah, that, I mean, this this information is so critical that we really felt the need to, um, and it's so global in nature that this we need to put this entire book full text free online at birdflubook.org. I mean, all the citations are hyperlinked, all you know, three thousand one hundred sixty-eight of them. I mean, we it's 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 all there. Um, and uh, in hopes of really kind of sparking a discussion on these critical global health issues. Wonderful. I want to thank you so much for being on the show, Dr. Greger. Um, people can find out more about your book at that site. Of course, you can order it through Lantern Books. And uh, it is really a tremendous book. I recommend it very highly to anyone who's interested in, in understanding this. Actually, anyone should read it. It's just a, a book that will simultaneously scare the hell out of you and, and enlighten you. <laughs> so, thank you so much. The catchphrase is, prepared, not scared. Okay. I like great. that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks once again to Dr. Greger for talking with us about his book. Absolutely. And we much appreciate his time. We know he's a busy man and he speaks all over the place. He does. He does a lot of outreach. He does. And uh, a lot of it's quite effective. He talks to people about the health benefits of veganism mm-hmm. and he's written a lot of books and good stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think that's about it for this week of Vegan Free Radio. Two six seven two nine five ninety forty four. That's right. We will get to your voicemails eventually, and your emails, and everything else. Yeah, we do have some good ones that we we've gotten in the past couple of weeks, and they're in the queue. So yeah, we've got the queue. Mm-hmm. We've got the queue. <laughs> we also have full time jobs too. So you know, on occasion, we don't have as much time to put into a show. We end up with a show like this. Well, you know, it's still out there. Yeah, that so. I mean shit. You know, there are worse things one could do with one time, one's time. All right. So send us an email. Send us a voicemail. Be in, in touch, touch with us and. Uh, Subscribers, I'll be in touch. I'll send an email when the, when the shirts are ready. You will know. You will have exclusive access, I promise, and a discounted price. All right. So what more could you ask? Really? Come on. <laughs> Great vegan radio, cheap T-shirts. On sweatshop-free T-shirts. Sweatshop-free T-shirts, indeed. <laughs> so, and not American Apparel? Not American Apparel. Anyway, see you all next week. Mm-hmm. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm. Bye. confused, Alia. You frighten them. Because I'm a freak.
And uh, I think what we'll probably do is accumulate all these for one big show sometime in the next month or so. What the hell's going on with my volume? Wonky knobs. My wo- <laughs> my knobs are a bit wonky. <laughs> so, so yeah. Would you like to play with my knobs? <laughs> you twiddle my knobs. You have more than one? Hmm. <laughs> could be, could be. Uh, if I do, that would be very special. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen pictures of people who have a third nipple and they pierce it? <laughs> No, I haven't seen his pictures. I have. Okay. <laughs> I, I guarantee you that Ida has as well, misanthropy. I'm sure. Speaking of misanthropy and third nipples. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great segue there, Bob. <laughs> I don't know if she has three nipples. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but someone does. Yeah. And I say... <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, she... Um, I only say it because she's heavy into the bod mod, body mod, modification community. Mm-hmm. That's why I thought mm-hmm. third nipple. <laughs> That's where I saw If anyone them. has seen a picture of it, she has. If, if anyone has seen a picture of anything that is really <laughs> fucking weird in terms of body <laughs> modification, Ida. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of Ida, we need to offer a very special Vegan Freak Radio congratulations to Ida and Richard mm-hmm. or Misanthropy and Living in Photographs <laughs> on our forums because everyone get close to the radio. They got married. <laughs> yay! <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. We only have the yay. I only have the booey. Boo. Okay, now that's <laughs> No! <laughs> yay! Just think that okay. this yay. Um, they got married. So, uh, not long ago, mm-hmm. they posted a picture of it on the forums, and it was like, are we married? Question mark. And no one was really <laughs> sure if it was true or not. We're here to tell you that, in fact, it is true. Uh, one of several vegan freak forum hookups. I know. This is... <laughs> This has been great. This is the second one. Yep. And so yeah, it's been awesome. So congratulations to two people who definitely deserve congratulations. Absolutely, and uh, I they're just both awesome, and yeah. I want to wish them the absolute very best with one another. So very happy. if you don't know who they are, um, you know you just have to put up with this. But <laughs> if you do know who they are, and a lot of you do have some sense of who they are, it is true they are married, and shall live happily ever after. Yes. Okay. Vegan dumb. <laughs> what? And, and happy vegan dumb. And happy vegan dumb indeed. <laughs> so, and uh, that's pretty cool, huh? Yes. I, cool. I have to say, I, I kind of thought it was coming, but I was a little surprised. Of course. A little surprised. Yeah. So that's one other announcement. Yes. And our other announcement is that our t-shirts should be showing up at Vegan Freak headquarters tomorrow. Tuesday tomorrow. Yes. Tuesday the 28th. If um, Universal Package Destroyers does not somehow destroy them or send them to the wrong house. Yeah, well, they're usually pretty good about sending things to our place. UPS is good. DHL, they suck. Yeah. Fuck you, DHL. <laughs> so uh, we hopefully get them tomorrow, and then ho- by Wednesday we should have a web page up where you can purchase your Vegan Freak t-shirts. Absolutely. What a great holiday gift. <laughs> <laughs> for yourself or for others. That's right. And uh, we're going to have uh, discounted prices for subscribers. Yeah, we will. And uh, we will... We will make the page exclusive to subscribers for a couple of days, probably yeah. three days or so. Mm-hmm. So probably Wednesday, we'll put put up the page. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we'll give it for subscribers only okay. and let them have at it. All right. And then after that, we'll open it for everybody. Okay. So subscribers, keep that in mind. Vegan Freak t-shirts coming down the pike. A unisex version and a, and a very attractive, very attractive unisex version and a very attractive girly shirt version. Yes. I think I'm going to wear a girly shirt. <laughs> mm. to show off your curves if you could see you, you can't see me right now it's a shame you can't because i i am i'm you're tweaking your nip I, no i'm not tweaking them i'm oh, okay. I, i'm kind of feeling myself in a very <laughs> sexy way you don't know what you're missing out there yes. if only you know what you know this is the weird thing about radio i can't see the thousands of you that are listening mm-hmm. and if i could i would never do what i'm doing right now this is true <laughs> that could be a good thing you don't know we could be podcasting naked it could be but we aren't. No. It'd be, be too, too cold. It'd be too cold. <laughs> uh, anyway, so a t-shirt soon. Assets and angels. I didn't, Richard. Yay! Um, what else? I think that's all for announcements. That's all for announcements. Okay, moving on. All right. Um, I think what we're going to do now is have we these annoying things from the media. It comes from Newsweek this week. Newsweek is so... I think we just keep the subscription so we can always bust on it. Yeah, probably. Um... But anyway, it's got, you know, their holiday gift guide. Yay! And it is so not vegan. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, and actually, Bob ripped these out this week. Okay, this is the page of Fashion for Her. Okay, starts off with 
uh, freshwater pearl, abalone, and crystal dropped earrings. Oh, wait. Um, um, oh, okay. I'm coming. You're, okay. Non-vegan. There we go. All right. For only $345. Um, a very dead jacket, gray fur coat, and it looks like rabbit. Non-vegan. Your, your death for the low, low price of $4,715. Uh, okay, the top, that's vegan. Uh, scarf, 100% baby alpaca. Not vegan. Yes. Ot vegan. Ot vegan. Uh, a mink and leather fur bracelet. Not vegan. Uh, cashmere gloves. Not vegan. A red leather wallet. The thing on the show today, probably, is that we have Dr. Michael Greger on the show. He'll be at the end of the show talking about his new book, Bird Flu. Mm-hmm. And we're going to do some little... Bits and pieces of things here and there. Yeah, uh, we are kind of like totally crazy this week, so we didn't have a lot. Like totally, <laughs> <laughs> we, like didn't have time to like put together a real like show. So like, oh, dude, we're gonna like do some things. Um, <laughs> we got a couple of things going on. Go ahead. Okay, first we have some announcements. Okay, and uh, we're also going to talk about is what we're gonna is the announcement the ass hats and angels thing. Is that an announcement or is that something separate? Sure, that's an announcement. Okay, we're also. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I don't know oh, what else we're going to okay. talk about. Right. Oh, we're going to help be- vegetarians go vegan. Yes, we yes, are. we are. <laughs> and we got some annoying things from you know in the media as usual, and that's about it. Yeah, okay, yeah. short show this short. week. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, it's going to have to be because uh, again, I'm afraid about my voice going south. <laughs> so. So. Yeah. Um, I guess the first thing we want to talk about is that uh, we listen to Sirius Radio. OutQ has a very nice show on, a uh, very good show on from Michelangelo Signorelli. And uh, if you don't know who he is, he's fucking awesome. I like to listen to his show pretty often. Um, and he does a thing every year. Who, what do they have? Well, on Thanksgiving, he does this annoying thing called the turkeys of the year. Species which, is. Yes. Which yeah. is a really annoying because these are people who are, have basically fallen in their assholes. And you know, right. people like Mark Foley and... Uh, uh, George Allen, you know, these kind of people got the Turkey of the Year awards. Right. But at the end of the year, he does these things, like the scumbags and <laughs> <laughs> gas, gas bags. bags. Gas bags. And, he uh, does the gassies. Yeah, the gassy awards uh, yeah. for people who are, you know, <laughs> are kind of still in power but really annoying. And, yeah. But then he also does the Angels of the Year for yep. people who really deserve some credit and for who, who've done good things. So we thought that on Vegan Freak Radio, we would make it fun as the holiday season approaches and actually have... An ass hats and angels contest. Yes, <laughs> not a contest, but you, you, our lovely listeners out there, can submit to us the names of people that you think are ass hats. And by ass hats, we mean ass hats in terms of veganism. People who have done something that has bothered you, offended you, annoyed you, that has not been good for the cause. That whatever, right? Right. And this can be, you know, anyone, anyone, anyone. in the media, and it doesn't have to be in the movement or anything like no. that. Just be, you know. Anyone who deserves that award. It could be someone in the movement, though. Sure. If okay. you wanted. Right. Uh, Ass Hats and Angels. So we'll, we'll be accepting it, nominations for the Ass Hats. And then Angels. I mean, it's obvious enough. Yeah. People who've done really great things for veganism. That's right. And we're going to throw in a few of our own of course. Of ideas. <laughs> and we want your suggestions as well, because we certainly don't know everything that's out there. So give us, uh, send us an email or give us a voicemail. Yep. Non-vegan. A burgundy mohair bag. Non-vegan. <laughs> and black leather boots. Non-vegan. Now, that is like the most non-vegan outfit I have ever <laughs> heard of. <laughs> and the pants, probably wool, they don't say. This is but, in the gift guide, too. Yeah. It's like, fashion for her. It's I mean, just absolutely disgusting. Okay, number one, right? All the species is bullshit aside. The fur, the leather, the mohair, the baby alpacas. Baby alpacas. I know. Come on, people. Baby, baby alpacas. Baby motherfucking alpacas. Okay. Baby alpacas. All that stuff aside. This shit costs a lot of money. I know. I mean, that entire outfit is probably like okay. ridiculous. The earrings, three forty five mm-hmm. U.S. dollars. Mm-hmm. Earth, U.S. Earth dollars. <laughs> the jacket, $4,715. So what we're already above five grand there. The top, four sixty six, mm-hmm. so fifty five hundred. The scarf, three twenty five, fifty eight hundred. The fur cuff, three hundred. So we're at uh, what's that, sixty one hundred. The gloves, fifty. So you know, basically still sixty. Wallet, is another fifty eight from Banana Republic. At that, uh, keychain, one hundred twenty five dollar motherfucking keychain. <laughs> now, come on, are you really that bourgeois? Do you really need $125? Does anyone need 100 This is like that guy who had the umbrella stand made out of gold in his house. Mm-hmm. The CEO of Tyco International. Mm-hmm. He was mis- – wasn't it that – wasn't it him? Yeah, I think so. Or was so. it Adelphia? Well, one, one of these of just, one yeah. of these fat corporate corporate pigs. Uh, well, th- 
species is terminology. Yes, yes, yes. Fat corporate cats. Uh, mm. No. Capitalist Assholes? bloodsuckers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> capitalist blood. Another one of these capitalist bloodsuckers um, who had a $16,000 <laughs> gold umbrella stand in his house. Yeah. You know, like Lewis Black said, some of us have already have an umbrella stand in our house. It's called the bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, point is, it, this is a very expensive outfit. And, you know, Jenna, I love you dearly, but there is no way on God's green earth I would ever spend seven, eight, or nine thousand dollars on an outfit for you. Good, for I certainly hope not. Because I know if I did, it'd be the last thing I ever did. <laughs> and you, especially not full of dead animals. Well, you know, this I've is just it's just like, it's disgusting to me that in a mainstream magazine like Newsweek, they're pushing fur. Yep, and they have this other page too. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one is the splurges under the splurges. It's the Epsi clutch, so beautiful she carried around the house. Do we mention it's made of brown mink and chartreuse satin and has a snake brooch? Santa, baby! $1,050. From www.christianlubouton.fr. I don't speak French, but I'm guessing <laughs> if I were in a cafe somewhere smoking, that's how I would say it. Christian, in case you want to go to the website and tell them how much they suck, C H R I S T I A N. They stare at me, they whisper when I pass. It hurts my feelings. They're confused, Alia. You frighten them. Because I'm a freak. You're not a freak. Who has said that? No one. Then don't you ever say it again. My children are not freaks. But I can't help it. I just know things. Things I shouldn't know. But I just do. No one should ever be wakened to consciousness as you were. But we'll make them understand, Alia. We'll make them see. It's Vegan Freak Radio number 54. Welcome to Vegan Freak Radio, number 54. I'm Jenna. I'm Bob. It is Monday, the 27th of November, 2006. Hope everyone survived in the U.S. Uh, the Dead Turkey Day. I hope so, too. Dead Bird Day. That's what yes. I call it in class. Once. I'm like, <laughs> like eh. But it really is a dead bird day. It is, unfortunately. I agree, unfortunately. I was thinking the other day about, man, how many millions of turkeys must be killed just for that day. Yeah. It's really screwed up. It's really sad. Did I say screwed up instead of fucked up? You did. What the hell's wrong with you? I don't know. <laughs> I've been talking too much today. Uh, two and a half hours of lecture, and now I come here and do a radio show. All right. I hope I don't lose my voice. Yeah. <laughs> just, I, just hope that. What? Just hope that you don't lose your voice. I hope not, because uh, I have a big class, 60 students. One of my classes, I lecture without a mic, and uh, I leave there. I'm usually kind of hoarse. Mm. So I'm feeling a little... I don't know. I, my, my voice feels kind of odd today. <laughs> You need a soothing tea. I had a soothing tea. Okay. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, anyway, uh, another week of Vegan Freak Radio. We got a couple things going on today. The big thing on the show today, the more, the most interesting